Good evening. Happy Sabbath to you. I know you had a rough week, but it's going to get better starting tonight. Amen. I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing to some and, and reintroducing to others our speaker for tonight. He is R. Clifford Jones. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. God doesn't make any mistakes. He knows what we need, and he always sends just the person that needs to speak for him. Now, you know, I could uh, insult your intelligence and read every word of this, uh, this program, and um, some of you don't have it tonight, but you'll have it tomorrow, but I'm not going to do that because I want to hear the word. And if, you spent, if I spent all my time <laughs> talking about what he does, you won't be able to hear what God has for you. But I will say this, that Dr. Jones currently serves as the president of Lake Region Conference, Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it was organized in 1944, and he is, its uh, headquarters is in uh, Mokina, Illinois, uh, spanning the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana. I could tell you a lot about Dr. Jones, for instance, and he was elected in 2014 as president of the first regional conference to be organized. I could tell you that prior to, to his role there, he served as the chair of the Christian ministry department and as an associate professor and professor in the department because of his deep love for pastoral ministry. He still teaches. He served as a senior pastor of New Life Fellowship at Andrews University from 1997 to 2004. Before joining uh, the Andrews University faculty in 1995, Dr. Jones uh, pastored in the Northeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists from 1979 to 1995. He was ordained in 1983. From 1991 to 1995, Dr. Jones also served as an adjunct professor in the Doctor of Ministry program at New York Theological Seminary. Uh, he graduated with an M.A. from uh, Andrews University in 1979 and with a Doctor of Ministry from New York Theological Seminary in 1989. Whew. In 2001, he earned a Doctor of Philosophy from Western Michigan University. Look, all of these things, and I've left out a number of things, tell you what he's done. But I just want to say very briefly, from my perspective, who he is. The Bible says that the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He is a good man. Uh, one of the reasons we know he's a good man is because uh, he uh, is a married man, married to the former Elva A. Williams, and they have two adult children. So he's a father and a husband. He's an educator, he's an author, a writer, a teacher, a preacher, and I could go on. Ah, we want to hear the word tonight. I, I was talking with him, talking with a couple people earlier, and we were talking about the fires. You know, in California, there are a lot of fires. In fact, I left my home in Northern California to leave fires, and I went down to my office in Southern California, more fires, and I went to bed and woke up, there was a new fire. Now, you know, folk are concerned when you got all these fires all over the place. But you know, when fire is contained, it's a good thing. I said, when fire is contained, it's a good thing. I'm praying for the fire of the Holy Spirit tonight to come from the preacher. Amen. I'm praying that God will take a coal from off the altar and ignite Dr. Jones' lips and that we will see a fire in this place tonight that will burn till Jesus come. I will simply say that it is an honor and a pleasure to know Dr. Jones. I know him as a man who cares. I've sat around the table, the committee table with him, and he's a man who makes decisions for the glory of God and for the good of his brothers and sisters. And I got to believe that it was no accident for God to send him here tonight. And so after you've heard the music of Chiza, then you will open your ears and your mind to hear the word, a burning word, a word that will burn within you from Dr. R. Clifford Jones. Hear ye him. i 
of Jesus say come unto me and rest what a mighty God we serve good evening everybody come on good evening everybody aren't you glad to be in God's presence this evening amen God is good and all the time our God is good. My wife and I are delighted to be here this evening and this weekend to celebrate with you, to participate with you in this 39th convocation. Amen. I began in ministry 40 years ago. Yeah, I'm old. I'm old. 1979. 40 years this year. God is good. So 39 years you've been coming together 
to worship God and to celebrate and to trace the hand of God in your ongoing story. And this year is no different. Thank you, Dr. Palmer, your fearless leader for inviting my wife and me to be here today, this weekend. Amen. And thank you for your generosity and hospitality. Amen. Thank you to my good friend, Elder Virgin Childs from the Union. We always need to recognize the brethren from the higher organization. Come on, say amen, somebody, for the higher organization. Amen. Thank you to your executive secretary, Elder Ramirez, for his presence and for his support. And thank you to Pastor Williams. I'll say more about him on tomorrow. Amen. Again, my wife and I are delighted to be here, not only because when we left Chicago, we left snow on the ground and temperatures in the 30s. So we're glad to be away. Amen. Glad to be away. Amen, amen, amen. We're not going to be long. Did I hear someone say, take your time? We're not going to be long. <laughs> Amen. Like I said, I've been preaching now for 40 years. And uh, my preaching over the years has been guided by what I refer to as the preacher's beatitude. The preacher's beatitude. Did you know? Or, or do you know the preacher's beatitude? How many know the preacher's beatitude? The preacher's beatitude is simply this, Brother Pastor. Blessed is he. Blessed is he. Who preaches a short sermon. For he shall be asked to preach again. That's it. So if you learn nothing else this weekend. If you learn nothing else. You've learned the preacher's beatitude. If you have your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, the hard copy, the hard copy, the book of John, the 12th chapter, John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20, and I'm reading from the NIV, and in respect to the word of God, I'm going to ask you to stand. Now, there were some Greeks, some Greeks, among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. 
But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You may be seated. A defining feature of the ministry of Jesus was his people pulling power. Even a cursory reading of the Gospels reveals that wherever Jesus went, huge crowds flocked to him. Our Father, our Lord, the Messiah, was a magnet for the masses. Luke writes in Luke chapter 5, verse 15, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Now the reasons why people flocked to Jesus are many and varied. On the one hand, there were those who flocked because of his love and compassion. There were those who followed him because of the miracles they heard and for the fact they wanted to experience a miracle. Again, issue may be made as to why people follow Jesus, but one thing is for sure, and that is wherever Jesus went. He pulled a crowd. Tonight, the title of this message simply is, We Would See Jesus. We would see Jesus. Father God, as we open your word, may we also open our hearts. We pray in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. They were Greeks by birth. But it is doubtless that they had moved on from Greek religion. The profound speculation of Greek philosophy had failed to satisfy their spiritual yearnings. It is doubtless too that they were flirting with Judaism, for why else would they have come to the capital for the yearly festival? It is doubtless too that the step they had taken must have cost them much, for you see, to the Greeks back then, all other people were barbarians and outsiders. They were Greeks. Only a deep seriousness preacher, a bold desire, could have induced these men to take such a step. They came seeking, living up to the light that they had already had on their way. They heard the gossip about the young preacher from Nazareth who in three years had become a lightning rod of controversy. Bits of what the young Nazarene had been saying had reached their ears. Parables of his, arresting and provocative, had been retold to them. They heard of his mysterious power of healing. His claim to forgive sins. 
His assertion that he himself was the way, the truth, and the life. And his astounding audacity in daring to supersede the very laws of Moses. The reported sayings of the remarkable Galilean had awakened a desire in them. And so they journeyed. They talked about him as they journeyed. They talked about what he had said, what he had done, and how he had shed a new and fuller light on the law and the prophets. Now, to men of their temperament and disposition, all they had heard was interesting. More appropriately, it was disquieting. As they reflected on what they had heard, they became more and more obsessed by the longing to seek and see for themselves the Galilean and his friends. So they entered the city amid the hosannas of the populace. As they did so, they knew they had to act. Finding Philip, whose birthplace was largely Hellenistic in population and who was the only disciple with a Greek surname, leading them to surmise that he may have been familiar with their language, they said to him, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, please understand that in going to Philip, they went to the right person. You see, Philip was accustomed to dealing with such natures. At the beginning of his discipleship, he had been met by Nathaniel's skeptical, skeptical inquiry. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? To this question, Philip had the good sense to reply, well, come and see. Come to Jesus. And see for yourself. Nathaniel did and his prejudice was dissolved. These Greeks had surmounted the difficulty that Nathaniel had felt long ago. For they were open minded. But Philip knew that the need of those Greeks was no mere disciples testimony about the Lord. They had to be put in touch with Jesus himself. So Philip went to Andrew. He knew better than to go to James and John. Hmm? You see, a short time earlier, James and John were ready to call down fire on a Samaritan village whose inhabitants were half Jewish. Philip knew better than going to Peter, for Peter continued having trouble with Galileans right up to the time of Cornelius. Aren't you glad that God knows how to get the true and honest of heart to hear the good news? Now, what became of those Greek seekers? We are not told. The evangelist merely mentions their inquiry in order to describe the effect it had upon the Lord. The gospel writer never tells the effect the interview had on those seekers. Yet, the Greek, Greek seekers teach us at least two things. The first is that in coming to Jesus, we must overcome our prejudices as well as our passions. The second is that Christ cannot be ignored. Ellen White says that as the three wise men came seeking Jesus at the start of his life on earth, so these Greeks came toward the end of his life. And please don't overlook the fact that in both instances, the men came from foreign countries. Are you listening to me? They were aliens from beyond the household of faith. Truly, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. Truly, the gospel is now for everybody, Jew and Gentile, male and female, young and old, free and bond. The gospel is for he who endures to the end. The search, sir. We would see Jesus. It is a statement that in John's gospel means more than simply catching a glimpse 
of a celebrity who is performing miracles. It means that you really want to know and believe in Jesus. One of the dynamics we encounter in John is that to see is more than simply seeing something with our eyes. For John to see is to believe. We encounter this early in the first chapter of John. Jesus is gathering his disciples and one of them is Philip, the one who shows up in our pericope today. In chapter one, Jesus calls Philip and Philip finds his friend Nathaniel, whom he tells, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel is not impressed. Nazareth, can any good thing come from there? Philip does not argue. He simply says, come and see. In John 4, Jesus meets the woman at a well. And there is no classic conversation between the two of them. And it is clear that they are on different wavelengths. Jesus talks about how he is the living water. And the woman is incredulous. In the end, though, she comes to believe that the man to whom she is speaking is Christ the Messiah. And John says in John 4, 28 and 29, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to its citizens, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. There are seven signs or miracles that Jesus performs in John's gospel. The other gospel writers have a multitude of miracles, but John selects only seven to relate to us. At one point, the people ask for a miraculous sign so that they may see and believe in Jesus. In John 9, there is a wonderful story about a man born blind. Jesus, he's the man, and a long investigation follows. Was the man truly healed? Was he really born blind? Frustrated, the healed man says that there is a whole lot that he doesn't know, but one thing he knows for sure is that where as he was once blind now he can see even the disciples use the term seeing in terms of believing toward the end of the gospel of John Thomas is told that Jesus is risen we have seen the Lord the other disciples tell him Thomas is not impressed he says that he has to see the real marks in the hands of Jesus in order to believe we would see Jesus those Greeks in tone. It is a cry of the saint of ripe old age as well as the cry of the beginning Christian. We would see Jesus. It is the cry of the broken person. It is the cry of the prodigal who has traveled into the far country and longs to return to God. It is the cry of the hopeful person who walks by faith and not by sight. We would see Jesus. The desire of Jesus Christ, beloved, is the cry of every heart. Regardless of the quest on which we are bent, regardless of the road or thought or endeavor or purpose or aspiration we are pursuing, the rich know that there is a void in the heart which no amount of wealth can fill. The powerful know that there is a vacuum in the soul that no position can occupy. The philosopher knows that there is an opening in the mind that no amount of reasoning can satisfy behind all that people think or seek or live is a deep, persistent hunger for something higher, something deeper, and something broader. Sir, we would see Jesus. The cry of 21st century humankind is the cry of those Greeks. Christ is still provoking that quest and Christ is still responding to it. He is a challenge. He is a center of disturbance 
a power that is as great in our day as in the first age of the church. Sir, we would see Jesus. There are two questions which beg to be answered as we think about this declaration. Where and how can we gain a vision of Christ? Even from his closest followers, don't look past this. Even from his closest followers, Christ was hidden until he died and rose again. And the full meaning of his life and mission was obscure until it stood out large and luminous after his resurrection. You see, speculate about Jesus and you will not see him. Make Jesus a theological thesis and you will not see him. Admire him only and you will not be like him. Learn from him only as the supreme religious philosopher and you will not see him. But kneel at the cross and you will see him. Come on, say amen, somebody. Yield your heart to him and you will see him. Decide to live for him and you will see him. What is the price to be paid for that vision? First, we must search. Seek ye my face, Jesus says. If we would see Christ, we must seek Christ. But if, there, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. The road to Christ is the road of sacred prayer. The road to Christ is the road of reading the Holy Scriptures. The road to Christ is the road of worship. The road, to, the road is plain but not easy. It leads away from self-assertion to self-humiliation. It is wet with tears. And you can travel it only on your knees. But it leads to Jesus. It leads to Jesus. And that's all that matters. Now in response to Philip and Andrew, Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? No! It was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. It is, it is a rather typical response in the Gospel of John. Typical because it is complicated. John loves complicated dialogue. But brush away the dust and look deeper at this long, complicated answer. And you'll hear Jesus saying, the hour has come. I'm about to die. But I will rise again. I will rise again. Follow me. To see Jesus, to believe in Jesus, means first of all, to believe in his death and resurrection. And until we come to see Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to accept the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus, God and life will make no sense at all until we come to believe in the power and reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have not yet come to know Jesus at all. You see, take away the resurrection and there is nothing left in the gospel that has not or was not done by somebody else. Jesus said he was the son of God. Others have claimed that. Jesus healed miraculously. Faith healers have always been with us. Of course, some have been charlatans. Jesus was a great speaker. History is full of great orators. Jesus raised the dead like Lazarus. In the Old Testament, Elisha raised the dead. 
The one thing that sets Jesus apart. One thing that authenticates everything else that Jesus said or did. The one thing that gives meaning to the fact that when he said he was the son of God, he really was the son of God. And the one thing that gives meaning to every single action of Jesus and the one thing that helps us to understand him is the resurrection. Without the seal of the resurrection, Jesus fades into history as just one more great teacher. But with the resurrection, we begin to realize that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. My eldest brother, when we moved to New York City, turned his back on the Christian church and became a Muslim. He told me once he had to go to Mecca. I asked him, why for? He told me he had to make this pilgrimage and that he wanted to go to the grave of Mohammed. I said, what? Mohammed. Who Mohammed? Then I said to him, who is Mohammed? I was playing dumb. He told me, well, that's the great prophet of Islam. I said, well, why are you going over there? He said, to see his grave. I said, oh, he has a grave there? Yes. He said, and I want to go to pay homage. I said, well, what's in the grave or what's in the tomb? He said, his remains. I said, well, who is? Tell me, tell me once more. Who is this, this, this Mohammed? He said, well, he's like your Jesus. He's like your Jesus. He's like your Jesus. I said, oh, yeah. Uh, 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 but didn't you tell me he's in, he, he, he's, he's in his, his, his bones are uh, in, his to, in Mohammed's tomb still? He said, yeah. I said, well, he ain't like my Jesus. I say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I've been over there. I've gotten down on falls and I've crawled into the tomb. And guess what? Can I have a witness in the house? He walks with me and talks with me. How do I know that he's alive? Because he walks with me. He woke me up this morning. Clothed me in my right mind. We would see Jesus. But there's another way I gotta move along to look at the strange response of Jesus to the query of Andrew and Philip. Jesus may have been trying to convey to them and to us that the Jesus we may be looking for is not the one that is. Preacher, what do you mean? You see, Jesus is unconventional unorthodox, unpredictable, uncontrollable, and unsafe. Jesus taught that the kingdom of God belonged to little children and that the only greatness was the greatness of descent. Jesus crossed the social and economic barriers of every description to reach people for the kingdom of God. He defied corrupt church authority and called scribes and Pharisees hypocrites to their faces. Jesus broke the yoke of Roman oppression, yet taught his followers to love the oppressor. And to pray for their redemption. In other words, beloved, it is for this reason that we may be surprised at the places and the people in whom we may find Jesus today. You see, Jesus comes to us in the sad, lonely faces we see staring through broken panes of rat infested roach carpeted tenements can you see him he comes to us in the dirty maladora's bodies heat on the sidewalks of the jung concrete jungles we call cities can you see him 
He comes to us in the large frightened eyes of men, women, and children whose emaciated bodies, ravaged by the AIDS virus, lie still waiting to die. Can you see him? He comes to us in millions of children whose large heads and bloated bodies testify of starvation and malnutrition. Can you see him? He comes to us in the bag lady and the street mom and the pregnant teenager and the struggling alcoholic and the estranged wife and the confused homosexual. Can you see him? He comes to you in me, and he comes to me in you. Can you see him? Beloved, it is possible to stand in the presence of Christ and not see him. It is possible. To stand in the presence of Christ and not see him. Christ was veiled to the Pharisee because of the Pharisee's self-righteous pride. He was veiled to the Sadducee because of his determined skepticism. He was veiled to Pontius Pilate. He was veiled to Herod because of Herod's arrogant lusts. And because Christ is the antithesis of sin and self-assertion, the world which knows so much about him still knows him not. And we Adventists must be careful that Jesus doesn't get lost in our doctrines. You see, we can get so caught up with keeping the Sabbath that we miss the Lord of the Sabbath. We can get so caught up in the sanctuary that he gets locked out of the sanctuary. We can get so caught up in the state of the dead that Jesus is not seen as the resurrection and the life. Can you see him? We need to lift Jesus up as the Lord of the Sabbath. We need to lift him up as the high priest in the sanctuary. We must lift him up as the creator and owner in our stewardship. We must lift him up as the resurrection and the life. Would to God that each time I got up to preach, you saw not me but Jesus. As the hymn writer put it, not I but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted, not I but Christ. Be seen, be known, be heard, not I but Christ. In every look and action, not I but Christ. In every thought and word, can you see him? Sir, we would see Jesus. The country preacher was preaching about seeing Jesus when the lights in the old rickety church building suddenly went out. Flabbergasted, he froze. He froze, preacher, he froze, he froze, he froze. Not being able to see even his hands in the pitch dark. After a short pause, a frightening pause, the darkness was pierced by a shrill voice from the rear. It was an old saint who shouted, go on, preacher. We can see Jesus in the dark. Go on, preacher. We can see Jesus in the dark. Can you see him? Can you only see him in the light? Can you see him in the dark when the lights go out? Can you see him? He was born in an obscure village. The child of a teenage girl. He spent his first hours with animals. He grew up in another village, a refugee, a refugee, a refugee. 
He worked as a common criminal, as a common carpenter, sorry, until 30. Then he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, never held an office, never owned a home, never went to college, never owned a degree. Never traveled 200 miles from where he was born. He never did anything associated with greatness. While still young, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was subjected to the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, stripped of his clothes, and placed in a borrowed grave. But early Sunday morning, <laughs> early Sunday morning, who was it that said they saw this great, this great, uh, a masterpiece of painting hanging in a museum in London. It was entitled Checkmate. And there were two men playing chess. And ostensibly one had checkmate the other. His king couldn't move checkmate until one day a Russian chess champion walking by stopped and he looked at the painting and he looked at the painting and he looked at the painting until suddenly he shouted out, Liar! The king has another move! Oh, beloved, the king had another move early Sunday morning. He came out of that tomb. We would see Jesus. Somebody says, preacher, the last time I saw him, he was at an old rugged cross. But the next time I see him, he'll be riding on a white horse. Oh, the last time I saw him, his feet were spiked to the upright. But the next time I see him, the earth will have become his footstool. The last time I saw him, his hands gripped dusty iron spikes. But the next time I see him, they'll be clutching a golden scepter. The last time I saw him, he had a crown of thorns on his head. But the next time I see him, he'll be wearing a royal diadem. The last time I saw him, the words Jesus, King of the Jews, were written above his head. But the next time I see him, he'll be King of kings and Lord of lords. We would see Jesus. But the question tonight is, can the world see Jesus in you? Can the world see Jesus in you? If you mean business tonight, and you want over the course of this weekend to see Jesus because beloved it is all about Jesus it is Jesus we need to see it is Jesus we need to experience in every church in this state we need to see Jesus every time we come to church we need to catch a glimpse of Jesus why because Jesus declared and I if I be lifted up I'll draw all men to me. So lift him up in Sabbath school. Lift him up in choir rehearsal. Lift him up at the divine service hour. Lift him up during the AY program. Lift Jesus up. And remember that the only Jesus some people will ever see will be you. Can the world see Jesus in you? How many believe the word of God tonight? If you mean business and you want to commit yourself to seeing Jesus every day, to commit yourself to live such a life that the world will see Jesus in you, stand to your feet wherever you are.
our Father, our God. We're standing not simply because we're close to the end of the service. Our hearts have been stirred tonight by this simple message. Sir, we would see Jesus. That ought to be the declaration of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl under the sound of my voice. Tonight, we would see Jesus. Why? Because the vision of Christ transforms. The vision of Christ empowers. The vision of Christ emboldens. The vision of Christ sets us free. The vision of Christ sets us on fire. And that's what we need to endure until the very end. So bless us, O oh God. And may we search for Jesus each and every day. We ask it with thanksgiving and joy abundant in your name. Let all of God's people say and declare. Amen. 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 Can the world see Jesus?